Bring in show music, please. I'm CNBC producer Claire Odumodi. Today on Squawk Pod. Wall Street's top stories, betting on congressional elections and open AI in the largest venture capital race of all time. Are you with us or against us? Give us your money and don't give any money to anybody else. Exactly. Plus, a massive dog worker strike threatening commerce and politics. Republican Senator Shelley Moore Capito joins us. And I do believe that President Biden's been asleep here, but I think he needs to wake up in terms of his abilities to invoke Taft-Hartley as President Bush did in 2002. And why are we so divided? Author Michael Morris on the dangers of tribalism. It didn't start with Democrats hating Republicans. It started from living in different worlds, holding different beliefs, and then being baffled at the other side. It's Thursday, October 3rd, 2024. Squawk Pod begins right now. Stand back you by in three, two, one. Cue it, please. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Squawk Box right here on CNBC. We're live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. I'm Becky Quick along with Joe Kernan. Andrew is off today. And OpenAI, uh, let's remember this number, has closed its long-awaited funding round, and the valuation of that uh, company is $157 billion. So it raised 6.6, and that's what it comes out to, 157. Uh, a year from now, will they raise money at 300? Uh, billion? Who, who, I don't know. Nobody knows. OpenAI did not name the investors in the round, but a source tells CNBC that it was led by Thrive Capital and included participation from existing uh, backers, Microsoft, as well as NVIDIA, SoftBank, and others. The Financial Times reports that uh, during the negotiations, OpenAI made it clear that it expected an exclusive funding arrangement, asking investors to avoid backing rival startups such as Anthropic or Elon Musk's XAI. That's a really weird requirement I to, guess not, uh, to say you're not allowed to, to invest in any of our competitors if we're going to let you invest in these rounds. I uh, like it. It's like, I, I mean, it, it speaks to how strong the demand is. Well, where is your, right, but where's your, you know, you, you with, uh, are you, you with, with us you? or against us? Give us your money and don't give any money to anybody else. Exactly, and then we can all be on the same page. Hmm. Open AI. Let's go. LFG. Whatever what does that stand for? Yeah. <laughs> I see that all the time. I like it. Hmm. I like don't you? I don't see it all the time. You don't see it? No. You know what I'm saying. I, I, I do. You figured it I out. I can figure it out. Okay. It's all, the F is, that's what the F always is. L O L. <laughs> L O L. Uh, Let's mention- land a lake's cheese. Oh, Land of Lakes. Yeah. Because when, it, when I go and I grab it out of the thing, it, I'm getting some cheese and it says LOL. I go, why is this funny? And then I go, oh, no, no. You mentioned NVIDIA, one of the backers in OpenAI. We're also keeping an eye on those shares this morning. NVIDIA shares moved higher after yesterday's closing bell. That's when the CEO, Jensen Wong, made the comments about the company's Blackwell AI processors. Blackwell is in full production. Uh, Blackwell is, is uh, as planned. And uh, uh, the demand for Blackwell is insane. Uh, everybody wants to, to have the most and everybody wants to be first. NVIDIA's Blackwell chips boast two and a half times the computing power as its predecessor chips. He mentioned um, how everybody wants to get their hands on this. This is another case where Jensen Wog could probably set a lot of the guidelines too. Open AI saying you can't invest in anybody else. Uh, Jensen Wong has to figure out who to give these chips to because there's so much demand for them and some set up some way of putting people in the queue for it. Commodities uh, exchange Kaoshi <laughs> has resumed taking bets on the outcome of the 2024 congressional elections. The move came after a federal appeals court in uh, Washington, D.C. lifted a legal freeze on those uh, futures contracts uh, yesterday. And the court rejected an effort by the CFTC to prohibit that company from taking bets on which party would control Congress. A lower court had given the green light to such bets, but uh, they were on hold while the CFTC appealed uh, the decision. The appeals court said the CFTC failed to demonstrate that the public would be irreparably injured if trading went ahead while the appeal is being heard. Russ Benham from the CFTC made his case right here on uh, on the set with us, said that it's a way to manipulate elections potentially and there's no way to see who's making the money who's placing the bets on those things that was looking at it as part of his purview of it was the last time he was here that's all he talked about 
what I've said multiple times is this pulls the CFTC into the role of being an election cop. Because if there is manipulation of these markets, if someone does take a position, long or short, which would essentially be on a candidate, and then potentially puts out news that's not necessarily true, this could spiral into a situation where you have manipulation of elections. Seems like a, that would be the tail wagging the dog, but I guess it's possible. I mean, they also a lot look of at congressional it, races. But I mean, it's it, also a way of looking at market manipulation, and I think that's what they were watching. Maybe they're looking yeah. at the market manipulation of the, the contracts themselves. I don't see how you really can game an election based on moving a congre a, a four, How many seats are we talking about? I mean, and it's a it's a seven, six or seven seat. I guess difference I mean, right now. I guess you could maybe it, you could it, focus on one. If you, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's an interesting way of looking at things, especially when you're not allowed to even talk about exit polls, you know, and leading right. up to some of these things. You don't right. want to dissuade voters close, from going right. in, right? This is the first, uh, first we've seen, I guess, we heard about private equity and, and uh, the NFL. Now Miami Dolphins owner Stephen Ross is in advanced talks with a, a PE firm, Aries Management, and billionaire Joe Tsai to sell a stake in the NFL team and some other assets. Uh, and it would value the Dolphins at $8.1 billion. This is according to uh, a Bloomberg report that said that Aries would purchase a 10% stake also in Hard Rock Stadium uh, and the F1 Miami Grand Prix. Joe Sy, owner of, of the Brooklyn Nets and the New York Liberty WNBA team, would uh, buy 3% through his family office. Such a transaction now possible because the NFL uh, changed its rules earlier this year to allow private equity firms to buy stakes in franchises. Uh, Ross had been in talks with Citadel's Ken Griffin to buy a stake in the Dolphins uh, and other assets earlier this year. Uh, but the report says those talks fell through. So you see, with the wild card, oh, there's only one series left. The, the, all the other teams, it was best of three series, and they all won two games in a row. Like, You're just mad that you lost money. I did lose money on the, on the, on the Dolphins, but the Titans, I, I, you know, I, it's been so many upsets this year. You, it, I don't know who was really favored on Monday, but the Titans fine. And by the way, we should point out $10. One, You're not one like three. No, no, I'm yeah. not a big better. But the Mets are the only team that needs the, now it's a, not a game seven, but it's a, it's a game three in a best out of three series. So that's at seven o'clock tonight. Yeah, game seven. Yeah, it's like a game seven. Yeah, it is. It's like, for, especially for, for Mets fans. I kind of like, I kind of like the Mets, so I, I don't want to say that, though. I don't like the Mets. I'll Mets take it fans back. don't want you to say No, that. they don't want me to say that. I don't like the Mets. I do like the Mets, but I, I'll, I'll say I don't like the Mets. Thank you. Members of British rock band Pink Floyd have agreed to sell the rights to their recorded music and name and likeness rights to Sony Music for about $400 million. That's according to multiple reports that say the deal concluded despite decades of infighting between band members. The catalog had been up for sale for several years, but Variety said some potential buyers were scared off by controversial political statements yeah. by songwriter Roger Waters Crazy. against Israel and Ukraine and in favor of Russia and Vladimir Putin. It's a total whack job. Always has been. But David Gilmore, incredible guitarist. I, I'm surprised it's only $400 million. That's just... In fighting between own. the band members, political yeah, statements. Yeah, right. That's because of my own, uh, yeah. my own uh, love for, for, for Pink Floyd. But... Uh, David Gilmore has a new album out, and uh, he hasn't had one in a while. I think he's going to go on tour. I would go see him um, if you were, were... I never liked Pink Floyd. Oh, my God. They're amazing. Well, you didn't like... Hello, you didn't, hello. You didn't like... Is anybody you didn't like there? You didn't like hallucinogens either, so... No, I didn't smoke pot, so... What? <laughs> I didn't like... Today? It. Ever. Ever? I've been, a, I've been walking down the streets of New York City. It's hard enough to get a contact high here. <laughs> God. Cheese will be next. Coming up next, politics and personal finance. We'll get findings of a new survey about how folks are feeling about their portfolios in the lead up to the elections. That report from CNBC's personal finance reporter, Sharon Epperson. A new poll finds nearly a quarter of adults say the outcome of the presidential election will determine whether they're rich or not. And as the port strike enters its third day, we catch up with West Virginia Senator Shelley Moore Capito, who serves on the Commerce Committee. We know that shipping is a huge uh, industry and they're profit making. And so those employees should share in that, I think, as, as the benefits of their hard work. Squawk Pod will be right back.
Welcome back to Squawk Pod from CNBC. I'm producer Claire Odumodi, and we bring you the best of Squawk Box in this podcast every day. Here's Joe Kernan. Just a month, well, actually 33 days until the presidential election. One month, hopefully not two months before we know the outcome. But uh, investors say that they'll feel uncertain about the future of financial well-being until the results are in. Many are putting financial decisions on hold, but Sharon, I'll let you do your report, but we, we've known from the past that we worry a lot about it, and then when it's all said and done, it usually doesn't make that much of a difference. I know, there, yeah. I know, but still, that's not how people are feeling, right. Joe. You know, anxious. It's, it's, they're anxious, and separating politics from personal finance can be difficult for many people, particularly this election season. A new poll finds nearly a quarter of adults say the outcome of the presidential election will determine whether they're rich or not, and half believe the election outcome will directly impact their personal finances. That's according to a survey of 2,200 adults by the financial services firm Empower. Now, their retirement outlook may also hang in the balance, with 26% saying they're never going to be able to retire, 29% indicating they'll have more money in retirement, and 31% saying they're likely to be more financially secure in retirement, depending on who wins the presidency on November 5th. While the election adds another degree of uncertainty to markets, financial advisors say you shouldn't let it derail your long-term investment strategy. Instead, you should be focusing on your asset allocation, your goals, whether you're on track to meet them, and supercharge savings in your workplace retirement plans and individual retirement accounts. Also, of course, stay invested. The markets can be volatile around election, but historically generate positive returns over time. Still, many Americans are very anxious, and a survey by the CFP board, an organization that sets standards for certified financial planners, finds 80% of adults say they expect their personal financial situation will be worse if the candidate they vote for does not become president. That's a majority of Democrats and Republicans, and of course only one party will win. So financial advisors say have a framework for making financial decisions that keeps you focused on your goals no matter the election outcome. And if you're looking for an advisor to help develop a framework and set up a plan, check out CBC's sixth annual Financial Advisor 100 list, recognizing top firms in the country. You can see the full list by scanning the QR code right there on your screen, or you can go to cnbc.com slash FA100, Jeff. Yeah, only one party will win, but there's three different branches. Uh, well, it, so you get the House, the Senate, and the... Right. So that's like, uh, that's more than... than in, in the, hope, <laughs> the hope is that it's split uh, among a lot of people. So... The two sides that, that, that think they're going to lose if the other side wins in terms of the president, mm-hmm. are, are they, it's weird because threat to democracy was split down the middle. Which one was the threat uh, when, they, when they did poll? So what, what do they think on each side about what happens if, if the other guy well, wins? Well, when they're looking at what's going to happen in their con- greatest concerns, Republicans more concerned about increased taxes, Democrats more, mm-hmm. Democrats more concerned about higher health care costs, But again, there's framework for that. So financial advisors are saying for those people who are concerned about taxes and they have the money to do it, they're doing more and more Roth conversions right now going into this election. Health care costs, we're looking at open enrollment season. This is a time for people to think about what they can do. So about about Roth conversion. In in case taxes go up. You pay the taxes now. Pay the taxes taxes now, exactly. Pay less when you're taking it out down the road. That's an interesting perspective. The idea of, I I find it fascinating that people look at their situation and their their retirement accounts and they think that that's their money many of them are in traditional accounts yeah. where a lot of that money is going to be taken up with taxes you do a Roth conversion and then you don't pay taxes you pay taxes now you would pay a pay big tax bill now, now right but it but would not be at a lower pay. rate than later and yeah. that's interesting if you look at our deficits it's hard to imagine taxes are going down it's, exactly um, thank you what are you sure. doing Sharon what no, am I no, doing for my kidding. framework no, yeah, no no I'm just, I'm just kidding I'm just kidding <laughs> going over my plan <laughs> all right being aware yeah, well, okay. Checking things out. Good answer. Yeah. The port strike is entering its third day, and President Biden uh, is saying, at least at this point, he won't intervene, even though some manufacturers and retailers are pushing him to invoke a 1947 law that could suspend it. Joining us now, Shelley Moore, Senator Shelley Moore Capito. She serves on the Commerce Committee, great state of, uh, of West Virginia. Uh, it, it's been done uh, before when things get really serious, Senator. Back, President Bush invoked Taft-Hartley back in 2002, preventing uh, a port strike. Is that, is that in the cards? Um, maybe not right now, but soon? 
Well, I think the effects are going to be really felt here probably in the next several days. They say a week will take it will take the biggest effect of this strike. And I do believe that President Biden's been asleep here, but I think he needs to wake up in terms of his abilities to invoke tech. Taft Hartley, as President Bush did in 2002. You know, the, the eastern ports affect so much commerce, so much um, business, so much ability for food and agriculture, other things, that uh, this is essential, I think, for us to settle the strike, the strike to get settled. And the president needs to take a more aggressive stance here, I believe. It's an interesting political dynamic uh, now, Senator, because it, it in filing something bipartisan, and that's that's sort of support for labor, and it it wasn't always like that. So, both sides are are like trying to outdo the other in terms of their support uh, for working uh, people. And I don't know. So that that that's a dangerous combination. If you invoke Taft Hartley, you're kind of like cutting the union off at the knees. Are are you? Or how would it work exactly? It seems like you're you're removing the ability to to do what they need to do to, to try to, to, to get what they feel they're worth. Well, my understanding is that I, I fully support the working men and women on our docks. There's uh, 45,000 of them that provide incredible work and work hard and a lot of it's physical labor and, and they should be paid uh, according to uh, their, uh, th their abilities and what they're doing and get the overtime and all of these things because we know that shipping is a huge uh, industry and their profit making. And so those employees should should share in that, I think, as as the benefits of their hard work. Um, where I think what uh, we, we look at the rail strike that almost occurred several years ago, we saw that the president came in and tried to uh, get the two sides together, eventually did and and prevented what could have been a devastating um, uh, strike on on our rail workers this the same can be done for our dock workers we've seen this has been signaled i mean i've read where the union really hasn't been in the table much effectively over the last several months i hope that's not the case i hope that there's still all kinds of discussions going on uh between the union and and the um and the businesses, but the, the fact of the matter is, is these things foment, uh, they have a tendency to draw out longer. And I think it has devastating effects, as I said, on goods and services, but also, you know, we're looking into a huge shipping uh, time of the year for us, uh, moving into Christmas. Uh, it is affecting the whole East Coast. We've just had a devastating hurricane on the East Coast. We're, so we're going to need you know, emergency supplies more than we ever have. So there's other ramifications here that I think should drive the two sides together. I'm hopeful that they'll be able to settle this. I think in the interest of everybody, they will. Uh, it's just we want it sooner than later. And I think if the president would weigh in more forcefully, I realize the politics of it. It's an to election say, year. You it's know, an election year, but yeah. he doesn't need, he's between a rock and a hard place. He doesn't want the effects of a strike, but he also doesn't want to, uh, you know, he doesn't want to hurt, uh, you know, the union's ability to get what it wants or to get. Collective bargaining. Yeah. I mean, it, Senator Capito, what do you think of reports yes. that the union has turned down a pay raise of 50 percent and that so much of it is is reliant on automation and not wanting an automation to come in. And I, I realize you're a Republican. You've also, though, uh, drawn the support of the United Mine Workers of America. So you're not somebody right. who's a union buster on this situation. But what do you think of the offer that it sounds like they've turned down? Well, I, I, you know, I have been a, a vibrant, I think, union supporter in my own state because it's important. Uh, we not only with the mine workers, we have a lot of steel workers and others. But, you know, if you're not at the table and have reasonable re requests, you're never going to get there. So in my view, on the face of it, an American citizen looking and saying you're going to get a 50 percent raise, that seems pretty reasonable to me. And I think over the long term, more benefits uh, for, for the workers. I understand they're asked to work longer hours because of the way shipping works. It comes in, it's very intense. It goes out, the work sort of leaves for periods of time. So smooth over those rough edges. But a 50% raise in wages over time is, is an incredible offer, I think. I understand they're asking for 77%. When I saw that, I thought that was rather unreasonable in my, in my view, but a 50% raise is, 
is an amazing, I think, offer back. And I think that, that the leaders of the union ought to sit down and really realize what they're doing to the families who are now relying on another income because they're off striking. There, a lot of them are younger workers that have families that are really starting to be extremely concerned about their futures and how they're going to manage the next several months. And these are reasonable, I think, uh, offers that I think ought to be taken a lot more seriously than on the face of it. It, it appears. But, you know, we don't know really what's going on between the two sides, and hopefully they'll come to a resolution quickly. Senator, uh, Senator Capito, everything yes. changes when you're, uh, when you're this close to, to an election. And I, I, I could see many different things happening. And then, you know, then you got Boeing, you got all kinds of, it's very strange. And, and you know, all the hot spots around the world, it, it's a little distressing, well, is it not? I I, it is very distressing, but I, let's look at it at the face of the, the American getting up every day and take their kids to school. They want to work. They want to earn a wage. Mm -hmm. They want to earn a living wage. They want to be safe. To me, that's the political issue. Get, right. get our workers back to work, and that will go to the benefit of whoever can do that the, the quickest. Okay, Senator, we, we got, had other things we could have talked about, uh, I guess, the right. control of the Senate, House, et cetera, but uh, maybe next time. Thank you. I'd love to. Thank you. Next on Squawk Pod, can't we all just get along? Columbia professor Michael Morris on the division, the silos, the separate teams of tribalism. Somehow we're wired to hate outsiders. We're wired to hate the other. I think that's just not a picture that any evolutionary scientist or behavioral scientist would recognize. This is Squawk Pod. Papa and Becky, Q. You are watching Squawk Box right here on CNBC. I'm Becky Quick, along with Joe Kernan. I'm here. Andrew I'm here. is off today. Here. Our next guest has unique insights on the concept of tribalism and how it impacts U.S. politics, the C-suite, college campuses everywhere, as we saw with the unrest at colleges and universities earlier this year. Joining us right now is cultural psychologist Michael Morris, Columbia University professor. He's got a new book out this week. It's called Tribal, How the Cultural Instincts That Divide Us Can Help Bring Us Together. And Michael, thanks for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. I've watched your show for years. It's a real honor. Well, you're, we, the one, you're the one. We, we are thrilled to have you here. Um, but you have to explain to me, tribalism, I look at it as a, a pretty divisive uh, situation in the United States these days. How, how do you actually see it as a superpower? Well, I think tribalism means you know, the, the psychology that enables us to live in large communities with shared assumptions. And that's what got us out of the Stone Age, right? It's what underlies everything that works. An organization like this or, you know, the city of Manhattan, it works because we have, you know, a shared culture. But that doesn't mean that it never goes awry. <laughs> and we see it going awry quite a bit in the current moment. I think, I would like to say that it was prescience, but I think I'm lucky to have a book on tribalism coming out in the fall of 2024 when we have, we're teetering on the edge of a war in the Middle East and we have a really divided government and we have the largest labor union threatening to shut down the supply chain. So there's a lot of collective action in ways that not entirely positive right now. So this is tribalism gone awry. Yeah. And that's where we're looking for things that, that differentiate us instead of yeah. things that, uh, commonalities. Well, one of the main reasons I wrote this book is because I think that tribalism has come into currency as a term and as a catch-all explanation over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And what, the way it's often defined and talked about is that somehow we're wired to hate outsiders. We're wired to hate the other, another group. And I think that's just not a picture that any evolutionary scientist or behavioral scientist would recognize. Uh, we have these social instincts that are called tribal instincts, but they're instincts for solidarity, not instincts for hostility. They occasionally lead to conflicts where hostilities develop, but the, the conflicts don't start from hostility. So what went wrong? What, what, what went awry? I think it's a different story in, in every case, you know? So what went awry in our politics is a kind of tribalism, but it's not a tribalism of hate. You know, it didn't start with Democrats hating Republicans. It started from living in different worlds, holding different beliefs, and then being baffled at the other side, and then starting to doubt the other side's sincerity. And how did we come to live in different worlds? 
Well, the, the, the splintering of the media had something to do with it. You know, we used to all get our news from Walter Cronkite and we were kind of all on the same page. But when you have partisan news channels that, that uh, serve different constituencies, uh, we, are, we are living in bubble chambers and we're getting further and further apart in our assumptions. I mean, I thought it was, I, I, I'm ready to start looking at, uh, uh, you know, in, in you know, where you're doing an autopsy, I'm starting to think we need to look at brains. I think there's yeah. a, a left brain, right brain. I, there's things that I see in, in things I believe, I look at what other people believe and that's like Venus and Mars. Me, uh, not men, but one person's from Venus, the other's from Mars. I mean, left brain, right brain. I, I can't even figure where some of, of the thinking comes comes from at this point. What do we it, need, exchange student it, programs? Maybe, it's, maybe it is the, that people live in, in an echo chamber that gets drilled in for so long, they don't even visit the other echo chamber. That's right. And I think if we, if we understand that these echo chambers contribute to it, then there are things we can do personally. We can break out of our bubble. We can change the channel on our television uh, and get exposed to a different stream of news. Um, I think that one of the big mistakes is to think that these cultural worldviews are sort of permanent and we're stuck with them. But they're really not. I mean, we, we all have internalized multiple cultures and we switch between them. You know, we call it code switching uh, when, you know, it's about, you know, ethnic or racial cultures. But we all do that. You know, when you come into work, it's a different self. It's a different worldview than when you uh, go home or when you go to church or when you go to the gym. And so, you know, if we understand the levers that uh, cause people to switch from one cultural identity to the next, then we can lead people through their culture and we I can I mean, I'm not kidding people. about an exchange program student. I mean, all of us spending more time with each other and trying to yeah. understand each other. But uh, describe specifically what you think has gone wrong on college campuses, because okay. you're a professor at Columbia, yes, and this has been something that we Colum have watched Columbia. so closely at Columbia. with at Columbia. bafflement. You, you've actually talked to the president. I think you've tried to, I have. Tried to yeah. help. I've, I've, um, so at Columbia, a lot of us you know, are there because we, we take pride in a tradition of political engagement. You know, it's been a relatively political campus. And uh, that has gotten ugly at certain points in the past, you know, the Vietnam War, but it's also had some great results. Like it helped, it helped you know, fuel the anti-apartheid movement. You know, uh, Columbia was one of the first campuses and it spread. And it's one of the reasons that Mandela got released, this, this campus protest across the world. So a lot of us were kind of proud at first, but then, it, it, it clearly metastasized in a direction that was not healthy and that was not a teachable moment that nobody was learning from. You know, it was sort of activism that just became acrimony and the group started as, you know, expressions of solidarity for different groups of civilians in the Middle East. And a few months later, the groups thought each other were the problem. You know, they were attacking each other. And so uh, why why at Columbia did it go this way, whereas there are other universities? My wife went to Rutgers, and at Rutgers, things ended very constructively. The president, Jonathan Holloway, he, uh, he welcomed the activists. He said, universities learn from activism. This is the energy that helps us update our policies and you know, yeah, make ourselves I, better. I went to Rutgers, too. It, okay. it wasn't a smooth transition along that entire point. I, I saw a video of protesters where Holloway was there and then left, and the Jewish students who were there were kind of left with a group of angry protesters. He was taken out with police guards. Okay. So it's, it's not been smooth everywhere. It, it hasn't been Columbia there, for sure. Right. But I think, Michael, I think, but I think the, the, the campuses that are, have been worse are like UCLA and Columbia in the middle of really large cities where the student activists are ringed by professional activists and they, right. they start to see their mission as, as aligned with these more seasoned activists. Both, both sides, I think at Columbia, became co-opted by more extreme groups. The, the, the tolerance is, is a one-way street on a lot of these liberal campuses. And, and I wonder how that happened over years and years. Is it those are the people that are hired at the, the college campuses. It, I mean, it's nice to be, you know, to, to feel virtuous uh, and, and I'm, um, you know, there's a group of oppressed people that I'm going to, you know, go demonstrate for. Yeah. But it, there are actual times where someone might be ready to, for an opposing viewpoint and they're not welcome anywhere near that college. And, and that, that's not tolerance. That's not open minded. That's not progressive. That's just. I don't know, that's just closed-minded and tribalist. Yeah. Well, we did have two sides on our campus that were both 
represented you know, very forcefully. We had a sort of pro-Israel group, and we have probably the strongest ties to Israel of any major campus in the U.S., and we also had a strong you know, Gaza solidarity movement. But so you, had, you had students. They weren't listening. There was a pro-Hamas, there was a pro-Hamas, pro-October 7th, kill the Jews contingent. Yeah, but yeah, Jewish students I, I was there, I and it really, you know, the, there's always a difference between what most people in the protests are saying and then the extreme statements that get picked up by the media, right? They're all and back at a, school. There's a they, competition they, for attention. There, there was no, uh, there were no consequences. They, they were suspended. All, uh, the, some of the people screaming genocide of the Jews are back at school now. Uh, I agree that it's a tough question of what... Um, They'd be, they should be out. Yeah, I, you know, I, I agree with that. I agree that there, it's, it's not acceptable to, you Kids know. are afraid, they're still afraid to go to class, a lot of, a lot of Jewish students, and they're still being harassed and everything else. That's not, you don't go to a $100,000 a year Ivy school to not, Ivy League school not to be able to, to attend class because you're fearful. I think that the, yeah. the, the ball was dropped by a lot of, yeah. of, of administrators, right? By a lot of them. You know, it's, it's, it's not just Columbia. You, know, you look it's at Penn, true. you look at Harvard. No, I, and that's weird, isn't it? How, never where happened where happened are these people, history. how they all at these places? How, how they, they all got that well, in common. Tribalism, the wrong them, tribe. A lot of them just happened to be new in the job. Manu Shafiq was, she started on October 4th. You know, this happened October 7th. And what a lot of college presidents believe in is institutional neutrality. And it's not that they're against political debate. They think that if the president is silent and the university doesn't have a position, that that enables full debate among faculty and students. So the, the university hosts the debate, but is not a participant in the debate. Yeah. But that can look a lot like indifference. And it can look a lot like... Um, cowardice even and I think that you know Holloway maybe did a little bit better job of being proactive in, in welcoming I, I, I would the agree with that I would, I would, I would agree with that um, Michael thank you for coming in today um, thanks so much it's Michael it's, Morris the new book is called tribal yes I think my book tribal is very much needed in this moment of October 2024 and I'm really really happy to be here thanks for coming in that's the port for today. Squawk Box is hosted by Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Catch them weekday mornings on CNBC at 6 a.m. Eastern. And get the best parts of our TV show by following Squawk Pod wherever you get your podcasts. Have a lovely day, and we'll meet you back here tomorrow. We are clear. Thanks, guys. Thank you.